Brussels of a Scottish Parliament. In 10 days time, an election will take place which will set the course for the future of the United Kingdom. It may even bring about the breakup of Britain. Although the ramifications will be felt all over the country, there's one major qualification for voting in this election. You have to live in Scotland. The Scots are voting for the men and women they want to represent them in their new devolved parliament. The polls indicate the campaign is a straight fight between Scotland's two major parties. Not Labour and Conservative, but Labour and the SNP, the Scottish National Party. It's a tug of war between new Labour unionism and Scottish nationalism. Two men epitomise the battle. On one side, the steady hand of Labour's Scottish Secretary, Donald Dewar, and on the other, the SNP's energetic fighter, Alex Salmond. At stake, whether Scotland remains part of the Union or breaks away to become an independent state, it is the battle for Britain. We're in the middle of a battle for Britain. There is a battle for Britain now underway. The breakup of Britain, as a phrase, implies that there's something to break up. As far as I'm concerned, Britain has largely broken up. So there's a whole renegotiation of the constitutional order that will affect Scotland, yes, but will affect England, crucially, and it will affect the relationships between different peoples in these islands. The battle will not end on May the 6th, although the latest polls suggest that Labour will comfortably win more seats than any other party, they also suggest a new voting system, proportional representation, will make the SNP the main opposition, and its aim, independence in Europe, will stay to the fore. And the danger is that we have a, a group of insatiable nationalists who will demand to ask the question again and again, as they do in Quebec, until they get the answer they want. Scotland is different. There's the scenery, there's the church, the education and legal systems. There's a touchy sense of identity and fierce sporting loyalties. There's a deep sense of history. There's new pride in the kilt and the bagpipes. But perhaps most importantly, there's the politics. In England, Labour still enjoys the fruits of a sweeping general election victory, riding high in the popularity stakes. But here in Scotland, it's a different story. There's a powerful, popular and well-organised opposition, and that opposition is the Scottish National Party, the SNP. Scotland is not a, a county, we're a country. We're not a district area or region of England. We're, we're a, a nation in our own right, and of course any nation, Scotland included, England included, has the right of self-determination. The SNP wants Scotland to break the 300-year-old union with England and go it alone. But the significance of that, and the importance of the Scottish election, has yet to make an impact elsewhere in Britain. Do you know who the SNP are? No. Have, have you heard of Alex Salmond? Alex Salmond? No. Do you know anything about the elections that are going to happen in Scotland? No. Donald Dewar? No, I've got very happy on this. <laughs> have you heard of Alex Salmond? No. Do you know anything at all about what's happening on May the 6th? Um, Apart from the Scottish Parliament's opening, no, I don't know anything apart from no, It's that. not opening, it's the, the votes for the, the Scottish... votes. Well, I don't know anything about it then. Yes, NP, I think um, Alex, someone or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Do you know who Donald Dewar is? Um, he's a member of Parliament and uh, he, um, if Scotland becomes independent, uh, he'll be the first um, minister or prime minister, whatever would be, of Scotland. They know that there is a body of opinion in Scotland that would like to leave the United Kingdom altogether. That they can understand. The idea that Scotland will run more of its own domestic affairs but still stay within the United Kingdom is something that is not understood, not just by people on the street, but by a lot of people who like to think that they're sophisticated about political matters. So what are the parties battling over in Scotland? First and foremost, Scottishness an age-old fight for Scots' hearts and minds. 679 years ago, in the Great Hall, above the Great Arch, yonder, the estates of Scotland gathered under their king, Robert Bruce, and sent forth a declaration of the Scottish people's will to maintain their nation in freedom. 
the signing of the Declaration of Arbroath, which proclaimed Scotland's independence from England in the 14th century, is commemorated today by the people of that town. But certainly what we can say very clearly is that two out of three people in Scotland now feel predominantly, if not indeed wholly Scottish, rather than British. And certainly as a result, I think all the political parties in Scotland are aware that they need to appeal to voters with a sense of Scottishness and saying that they're a party that's campaigning for Scotland, that's a, that, that they are parties that uh, articulate Scottish values and the values of people in Scotland and do not uh, at all uh, land themselves in a position of seeing to be too close to being English and seeing English. A strong national identity felt throughout Scotland is not the monopoly of the nationalists. More home rule for Scotland has long been on liberal and labour agendas. A sense of Scottishness goes deep here. Even Tory unionists are in on the act. I mean, I, I'm Scottish first and British second, and that's how probably most people in Scotland see themselves. But, you know, I can be a proud Scot uh, without feeling in any way I need to have a separate Air Force or Army to prove it. I mean, I'm a Scot. I don't feel I have to wrap myself in a kilt to prove that. I mean, I've already been in tartan trues uh, for devolution, and uh, who knows, it might be the the full kilty for independence. Well, I've lived and worked all my life in Scotland. I'm committed uh, to this uh, country. I've only to open my mouth and people can see uh, and hear that I, I am uh, a Scot. The Scottish culture is not the monopoly of the Scottish National Party. It's something we all share. I don't think that I have to try and uh, adopt Braveheart um, uh, face painting. I was born here, I've lived here, I'm marked by that experience. We don't have to prove we're Scottish, we are Scotland's party and it's a major advantage for us in fighting the first ever Scottish general election for the first Scottish Parliament for 300 years. That the Nationalists can even claim to be Scotland's party shows how far they and the idea of Scottish independence have come. The United Kingdom is now a lot less united than it was in the heyday of Britishness. In 1945, Prime Minister Churchill and the royal family celebrated VE Day on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. All of Britain joined them. The political storm clouds forming were ones that were to blow the Conservatives out and bring in Labour. Then the Scottish National Party were an eccentric fringe group of wide-eyed romantics, cultural nationalists and anachronistic Jacobites. At one extreme, a small minority of Scottish nationalists wants Scotland a separate nation with its capital in Edinburgh. From foundation in the 30s to the early 60s, the SNP averaged only around 1% of the vote, presenting only a handful of candidates. Now they're fighting every seat in Scotland, and the polls predict that around a third of Scots will vote for them on May the 6th. Well, it has been a long march, but uh, I think the SNP has emerged in the last few years in particular as uh, the head of a national movement still, uh, but as a, a party with a, a defined political programme, a social democracy with a, a Scottish face, with a, a view on social and economic issues, uh, and appealing for Scottish independence on the basic basis of a vision of a civic society in Scotland as part of the European mainstream. I, I think it's a very up-to-date vision, it's a very forward-looking vision, but it still carries the, the excitement and the, and the passion of the past. For a century, on and off, the Labour Party, or elements of it, has argued for Scottish Home Rule. For the past 30 years, in the face of colleagues' hostility, Donald Dewar has been at the forefront of that drive. His darkest moment was the failure of the devolution referendum in 1979 and the Conservative government that followed it. Labour, by any measure Scotland's leading political party, now has Donald's dream of a devolved Scottish Parliament within its grasp. Obviously I want to win. I want to win because I think that uh, as a party that created the Parliament, that fought for the Parliament, that delivered the Parliament, we have a very real interest in um, seeing it through its first um, and early years, establishing that it really is going to serve uh, Scotland. And that would be an enormous, uh, I can't think of a better word than honour, uh, in a sense of responsibility that I would uh, tremendously welcome at the end of, what, 30 years, I suppose, on the campaign trail um, for this Parliament and for this element of trust in the, in the, 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 the people of, of, of Scotland. Political parties claim credit for bringing about the Parliament, but other factors helped fuel the demand for it. A renewed self-confidence and national pride blossomed through a Scottish artistic and cultural revival. 1979, without doubt, was the turning point. 
It's the first election I voted in, the one that brought Mrs Thatcher to power. In that same year, I voted in a referendum that didn't bring Scotland to power. The Tories never governed with more than 13% of the population's consent here. That's not democracy, that's tyranny. And people in Scotland became progressively more and more fed up with it. And 1979, I think, was the start of the cultural renaissance in Scotland. And the flourishing of the kind of painting we see here, music, literature, um, all of that has a connection with the political circumstances of that time and Scotland's extraordinary sense of disappointment and loss and bamboozlement. How could this be done to us? For a long time, it's, it's, it's as if we haven't had the, the confidence in ourselves, either culturally or politically. And I think, I think it's, no, it's no coincidence that it's now in the 1990s that you see a, a resurgence both in the language and languages of Scotland, both Gaelic and Scots, a, Filmmaking, music, fashion, uh, literature, and politics, it all seems to be happening at once. I, I don't think that's any coincidence at all. Do you think we're in a situation where culture is leading politics? I think so, very much so. I think you can see it in the Labour Party and, and the Lib Dems. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because they know that there is this groundswell that is coming from the streets. That's the interesting thing. It's not the intelligentsia that are moving and shaking things. It's coming from the very streets of Glasgow and Edinburgh and the Highlands uh, of, of real identity. And I think that's why it is so strong, because no matter what politicians or anyone else says, it's the people in the street that are counting. For 10 years, Labour and the Liberal Democrats campaigned for a devolved Scottish Parliament. The SNP wanted none of it. It was independence or nothing. Then, when it came to the referendum in 1997, the Nationalists joined the others to campaign for a Scottish Parliament with tax-raising powers. The Scots gave it a resounding yes, yes. The 129-seat Holyrood Parliament in Edinburgh would be different, more in touch with ordinary Scots, with power over health, housing, law reform, education and transport. Labour's hope was that devolution would, in John Smith's words, be the settled will of the Scottish people. Very senior Labour politicians were saying that devolution would kill independence off stone dead. Well, that has not happened. And I think people who are now saying that a, a Scottish Parliament and a Scottish Parliament actually coming into existence will kill off the constitutional issue stone dead, I think are in for a severe disappointment. The Labour Party made a fundamental error in allowing uh, the SNP to climb aboard the uh, Yes Yes bandwagon at the time of the uh, referendum. The result was that uh, Alex Salmond frankly stole the show and put Donald Dewar in the shade uh, and nationalism got a tremendous uh, boost from that and I think the responsibility for that very firmly has to be laid at the door of Labour. Whether that is the reason or not, Alex Salmond's personal popularity peaked last summer above Donald Dewar's popular in the polls but not in the press. There is not one newspaper for example in Scotland backing them um, and have ordeur heaped on them from almost every area and yet the public seem to disregard that and uh, vote for them, especially young people. Um, the opinion polls suggest that young people don't have such a problem with independence, therefore they don't have such a problem with the SNP. Have you decided already who, which party you'll be voting for? Uh, probably SNP. Quite a lot of my friends are voting for them because they want independence for Scotland. But I'd prefer, I'm just going to vote for Labour this year. Why will you be voting for the SNP? Probably be independent. Why? I just don't like English, to be honest. I mean, that's such, such a bad answer. No, I don't that's know. Sad, yeah. Have you decided who you're going to vote for? Um, I think it'll be Labour. I'll be voting for the SNP, I'm sorry. So, have you made your mind up who you're going to vote for? I have not, so... They're voting, they're voting Labour, probably, you know. Cause Labour or SNP? Uh, SNP, probably. Aye, uh, oh, SNP are too they're, naive. They're, they're, Do you know which party you're going to be voting for? Um, SNP. Why is that? <laughs> because it just will be. Why do you think there's been such a drive for independence and a drive for a Scotland. Scottish Parliament in Scotland? Brave up. I think that's been the really big, big impact on it. I think it's really taken a big impact. The Hollywood movie has managed to condition the enthusiasm of young Scots. Now in clubs throughout Scotland, they dance to the Braveheart tune. There's been a rise in Scottish identity at a time when there's been a diminution in British identity. And I suppose Braveheart 
was uh, in in a strange Hollywood way encapsulated that, encouraged it. In the end, it, it, I don't think any movie in the 1990s had more uh, political impact than Braveheart had. It was a time when Scots were feeling less uh, British than before and feeling more Scottish, particularly of a younger generation. <clears throat> and this mov movie seemed to give a kind of historical validation for it, regardless of the fact that historically it uh, wouldn't survive five minutes scrutiny. It wasn't a piece of history, it was a piece of drama, but it was a piece of drama that did strike home to the Scottish people especially. And talking to a whole range of people in Scotland, uh, I think it had a, a real, really strong message to them. And it's having a, you know, the resonance effect, yeah. The battle over Braveheart has been intense, with many pointing out its inaccuracies in the 13th century, never mind the 20th century. But there are a large proportion of Scots that are perfectly at ease with Braveheart, seeing it as a historic myth. Political Bravehearts can now fight the English, or each other, on computer. Um, Braveheart is a strategy war game set in 13th century Scotland. The player takes control of a clan leader, namely William Wallace, as they fight through the battles that will pursue them in the game. Yeah, so it's about strategy. That's correct, yep. There are two clear aspects of the game. You've got the hack and slash of the battle aspect of the game, but one of the main parts is the strategy management of your town and resources. So it's basically about government, isn't it? Uh, yes, I suppose in many ways the game is about governing. One feature that we have in the game is if you can't solve something diplomatically, you can simply pull out your claymore and solve it with the sword. With or without the Claymore being seen to be anti-Scottish can kill you off, as David McCletchy, leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, knows to his cost. His troops are still licking their wounds after all their MPs were wiped out in the last general election. I think we were unfairly maligned uh, in the past as being anti-Scottish. We've got to demonstrate, uh, as I believe we can, uh, in the language we use, in the uh, diversity of the candidates that we have standing for the uh, Scottish Parliament, uh, that this uh, English uh, tag that was labelled on us uh, is, is, a, is a lie, uh, that we achieved a lot for Scotland, uh, and that we can do much more because we stand for a lot of the values uh, that the people in Scotland do, of, of, of enterprise, of hard work, of getting on in the world, of doing the best for yourself and your family. The Scottish Tories are presenting themselves as a party that loves devolution more than anyone else, uh, which is actually quite difficult to take. After all years, all these years have been told that devolution was a thoroughly bad idea which could be consigned to the political waste bin as, soon, as soon as possible. Now the people have decided they want a parliament that works within the United Kingdom. The decision that was taken in the referendum, the decision that we uh, respect, we've now got to make that work and not allow the nationalists to drive us down the road of separatism. And there's the rub for Labour. Still a party of the Union, but it must produce a distinctly Scottish agenda for a Scottish Parliament. Donald Dewar, leader of the Scottish Labour Party, the man who delivered that Parliament and the man who would be King, or at least its First Minister. I remember the famous nationalist uh, jibe, we couldn't deliver a pizza, never mind a Parliament. But well, we've triumphantly done it, and I think the word triumphantly can be properly used. It's been a remarkable achievement, not of mine, but of a whole team. And having achieved that, I think we want to put the new Parliament to work serving Scotland. Now that means it's got to tackle what matters. It's got to tackle health, education, um, the uh, relationships with local government, the right spending priorities, law reform, transport. Now these are the things that affect the quality of life for people in Scotland. And that's what the Labour Party stands for. quality that, that people think first of all when they, they see Donald is, is his decency. He, he seems to be an honourable man. He passionately believes in, in what he believes in, but he comes across as somebody who's entirely credible and um, that you would trust with your will. 
you know, he's a lawyer, and, and people say, trust me, I'm a lawyer. Well, you, you, would, you would trust Donald, you would expect that what he says to be, be true, and I think um, his integrity is, is probably his highest selling point. But for all the qualities of its leader, Scottish Labour still has to shake off the criticism that it's controlled by London. It's certainly rather more difficult for Labour to put a kilt on things. That's why they're trying to argue that Labour's values are Scotland's values. But in a sense, the real reason why Labour have a problem fighting this election and ensuring that they do put forward a sufficiently Scottish appeal is simply because they are the government of Westminster. I think one of the tags that the SNP has managed to hang on Labour quite successfully is this London Labour tag. And this goes to perhaps the heart of, of, of Labour's tactical problem in this election. It is very difficult to see what a Labour Scottish government could do that is all that much different from a Labour-run Scottish office, and therein lies Labour's central weakness. The decisions that are going to be taken in Scotland are um, uh, going to be uh, for Scotland, uh, distinctively for Scotland, taken by Scots for this, for this country, and, and that is what matters. What I want to do is to work with Scotland and to work in partnership with the rest of the United Kingdom to work out the right distinctive uh, solutions for Scotland in these important areas uh, of domestic policy. Alex Salmond, leader of the SNP, wants not just domestic policy, but all policy decided in an independent Scotland. Now turning farther left than new Labour, he's targeting the traditional old Scottish Labour heartlands. For the first time uh, in a generation, there's a real challenge to Labour's political leadership in Scotland, and they don't like that sort of challenge, and that dictates how they react, and the sort of nap-bashing campaigns that we've seen are basically a result of, of Labour being challenged by the SNP. So I think the best thing to do is to put forward your case positively, that's what I do, both for independence and also how we can use the powers that the new parliament has to advance the social and economic condition of the, the Scottish people. He is an economist and uh, that's what he studied at St Andrews and that's what he went on to to be in, in his banking career, but he's also, uh, he also studied their medieval history, so he's almost got the dream ticket, as it were, for a nationalist leader. He's a guy with one foot very firmly in the modern world of finance, and another, he knows the lore of Scottish history like nobody else. He is seen as somebody who's rather clever, perhaps sometimes a bit too arrogant, but of course he's also seen as somebody perhaps who's not as experienced, he has of course never held office and to that extent therefore there is perhaps some doubt about how far he's a, actually capable of being effective if he were to be a government minister. Early in the campaign, Alex Salmond attempted to outflank Labour from the left, saying the SNP would ask Scots to forego the budget cut of a penny off the basic rate of income tax in favour of higher public spending. I don't think there is any support, understandably and rightly, for homespun hairshirt economics, which will lead to uncertainty and will almost certainly, almost certainly threaten the jobs in this, in this country. The vast majority of the people of Scotland will gladly pay these pennies to invest hundreds of millions of badly needed pounds in Scotland's public services of health, education and housing. Salmon's penny tax gamble failed to gain the support the SNP hoped it would, and his next move didn't help either. Now, a broadcast by the leader of the Scottish National Party, Alex Salmond, MP. It is an action of dubious legality, but above all, one of unpardonable folly. Unpardonable folly. Unpardonable folly. Unpardonable folly. Unpardonable folly. With British air crews in action over Serbia, Alex Salmond took a pounding. Up until then, Kosovo had not featured largely in the Scottish campaign. Salmond's broadcast brought it centre stage. The opinion poll evidence, while indicating that Scots are not necessarily believing that the bombing campaign is going to help, particularly in Kosovo, seem to have decided this is a black mark against Alex Salmond, that perhaps this is not something that a party leader can say, even if other politicians say it. But, uh, I think it's a fair question to ask whether a political leader on the eve of a major political campaign like this should be setting himself to have, um, you know, to have lots and lots of mud pies thrown at him by his opponents. Whether, of course, by May the 6th they will still have the same judgment must depend on events in Yugoslavia itself and the way in which the Scottish public react to that, and that, of course, is impossible to forecast.
I take the opportunity to speak my mind out. And I think folk in Scotland expect uh, Alex Salmond and their other political leaders to, to tell the truth as, as they see it. And uh, that's what I'll always do, and I'll do it without fear or favour. I'll tell the truth as I see it, and I don't regret that for a second. Last July, he was actually even slightly more popular than Donald Dewar as Scott's choice for First Minister. But since then, his, pub his public ratings have declined substantially and radically over time, such that rather than being somebody who appeared to be more popular than his party and perhaps able to bring people into the nationalist camp, he current at least now looks actually to be less popular than his party and not somebody who's helping to attract people to the SNP at all. So will it be Alex Salmond or Donald Dewar who will wear the crown after May the 6th? Whichever, Jim Wallace, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, is likely to be the man who puts it there. He is the likely kingmaker in the event of a hung parliament. It's not a title I would give myself. The real kingmakers are the people of Scotland. Uh, this is an election. All parties are arguing for the votes of the people of Scotland. We're fighting this, part, this election as an independent party, putting the Scottish Liberal Democrat case to the people and inviting people to vote for us on that. Jim must know that in the days following May the 6th, which I think will be the real uh, days of, uh, of, of political infighting um, and political activity, uh, I think that Jim really will, it will be up to him who is going to rule. However, the betting still is that will be a Labour, Labour, Lib Dem uh, coalition. It's far more important what you do than, than the party you do it with. The only precondition we have established is that we would not support a referendum on independence. Uh, that's a price we wouldn't be prepared to pay. Uh, and indeed, that's something the SNP have got to face up to. The biggest problem that both Jim Wallace, the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, and David McClatchy, the leader of the Scottish Tories, have is for getting anybody to notice them at all. It's very clear from the opinion polls that neither of them have a very high public profile. Large numbers of people don't have any clear perceptions of them at all because at the moment they are really, really very, seen very little as compared with both Donald Dewar and Alex Summer. <laughs> Braveheart country and standing on the monument to William Wallace. Over there is where Robert the Bruce won the Battle of Bannockburn and over there is Stirling Castle which changed hands several times in the wars between Scotland and England and which was incidentally the venue for the party for the premiere of the film Braveheart. Over there is Ockel constituency, scene of a bitter battle between Scotland's modern-day protagonists, Labour and the SNP. Ockel constituency is like Scotland in miniature. Highland meets lowland, east meets west, urban meets rural. A thriving university and high-tech companies alongside closed and closing traditional industries. Parts of the constituency have high levels of poverty and deprivation. In Westminster, Oakham is represented by a Labour MP, but the SNP is strong here too. A 4% swing is all the nationalists need to win the seat in the Holyrood Parliament. I'm a single parent on loan with three kids. It's a struggle as it is. And I'm not asking for miracles. Labour position is fees, right? <laughs> SNP position is fees out. Just do away with student fees, right? You want that or you want me a school, me a book for the school? <laughs> But uh, I have and, 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 and books uh, and, and equipment. I mean, children are swimming around in, well, we don't know what. And exactly. You know, and I think that's the problem. problem. Of course, the other problem, and uh, we're not getting it today because the wind's in the wrong direction, but is the smell. Electors have two votes and everyone counts to the candidates. The second vote, through a system of proportional representation, means that seats won will more accurately reflect votes cast. People are in the position, uh, the delicious position, although the frustrating one for politicians trying to second guess us, of being able to cast a vote for their preferred party in the first ballot and to have a luxury vote, a top-up vote, um, maybe a more adventurous creative vote for the second one. That second vote lets a genie out the ballot box by giving parties seats based on overall support, avoiding a situation like that which faced the Tories at the last election. 
on the, on the early morning of the 2nd of May 1997, I rejoiced, I think, with the large number of Scots when the Tory party got its just desserts and got no seats in Scotland. But, you know, as a Democrat, I can't honestly justify a party getting 17% of the vote and no seats. We thought there was something very odd about a situation where you could get literally almost 20% of the vote and not a single seat. And that, that it was right, in fact, um, to move towards a system that would ensure that every major strand of opinion was represented in the Parliament. Charitable giving, if you like, because certainly not uh, something the hard-boiled, cynical politician might advocate. But occasionally, I think it's refreshing to see a, a party that goes for principle um, uh, and puts that principle above short-term interest. If you regard Labour's principal objective in creating this Parliament is to ensure that Scotland remains in the Union, what it most needed out of the electoral system was a system that made it difficult for the SNP to win. And while, in order to do that, Labour has also had to reduce its own chances of winning, as compared with the first-past-the-post system, the traditional system, this is a system which makes it less likely that the SNP will ever have an overall majority in the Edinburgh Parliament. The political battle may be hotting up, but an enterprising ice cream shop in Hamilton in Lanarkshire has the perfect cool-down, election ices. Hi, I'm looking for some of your political ice creams. What flavours have you got? For the Lib Dems, we've got oranges and Lib Dems, which is an orange sorbet with Grand Marnie. Then, or you could have rose-tinted labour, which is rose petal flavour. Then something for the SNP, we've got Sweet and Patriotic here, which as you can see is in the shape of the Scottish flag. And for the Tories, we've got a Tory blueberry, which is a, a blueberry ripple. So, which is the best seller? Well, believe it or not, the only one I've missed out is the best seller is the Coalition Fudge. Oh good, I'll have some of that, I think. It's not only ice cream lovers that think that Coalition Fudge will be the favourite come polling day. Many political commentators agree. Remember, that it is highly unlikely that any party in Scotland will get an overall majority in this first election. Therefore, coalition politics are going to be the name of the game. Now it's the Scottish Nationalists versus the other three parties. And I think that when push comes to shove, and if the United Kingdom is really in danger, from a, a rampant Scottish nationalism, a Scottish national party, then you could well see all sorts of strange alliances uh, of Labour and Conservative, or Labour and Liberal, or Liberal and Conservative, because fundamentally they all agree with the same thing. And it seems to me that the future of the Union is more important than your policy on tax. We're not talking about formal alliances or coalitions. Uh, what I've said is that the one thing that we will not do Unlike the Liberals, who are sitting on the fence characteristically, is contemplate the idea of, in any way, facilitating or promoting the SNP separatist agenda. We are absolutely clear about that. We as a party, unlike the Liberal Democrats, have said we will have absolutely no truck with doing any deals that which might lead to the formation of an SNP administration or SNP-led administration uh, in Scotland. We will be a bulwark, an anchor of the Union. Most people are predicting that there's likely to be a coalition between the Labour Party, expected to be the largest party, and the Liberal Democrats. But you don't need to look very far to other European countries to say that one shouldn't predict uh, you're too far in advance in politics. Because once you have a proportional system, you can have the potential of some very unlikely uh, alliances. So uh, it really depends on how the votes fall out. But there's other potential coalitions, of course, between the Scottish National Party and the Liberal Democrats. One of the stumbling blocks to that is whether or not the Scottish National Party will insist on holding a referendum on the independence question. In 10 days' time, the ballot box will reveal who holds the balance of power in Scotland. But whether minority administration or the official opposition, the SNP will have a large voice in the Parliament and will continue to question Scotland remaining part of the Union. We're facing, if you like, the first phase of the battle of Britain or the battle for Britain. But I, I think perhaps too many commentators have concentrated um, on the next several weeks. Of course it is important to see what the outcome is in this particular election. But the Scottish Parliament is going to exist for a long time. And there's going to be no end of possible complications between its area of power and authority and the area of authority and sovereignty of Westminster. While the parties pull their own ways, it may be the pull of Westminster that causes conflict for the Holyrood Parliament. Because Westminster has retained a range of powers, notably defence, social security, economic and foreign policy. 
there are 17 pages of powers that have been reserved for Westminster and they're extremely wide-ranging. Now when a Holyrood Parliament gets going, all Scottish MPs worth their salt are going to want to be talking about these important things. I mean, nuclear power, nuclear armaments has been a big issue within the Labour Party for decades and that tradition is going to reassert itself. I mean, what is going to happen when a Scottish Parliament wants to, let's say, talk about the nuclear hulks that are rusting away at Rosyth, 13 miles from Edinburgh, is Westminster going to say, well, you can't talk about that? Or is it going to say, well, you can talk about that, but you can't vote? Or is it going to say, well, you can vote if you want, but we're not going to pay any attention to the vote? I mean, what kind of democracy is that going to be? I just think it's going to cause all kinds of aggravation. The greatest of these aggravations may be money, or the lack of it. Where Scots are most likely to end up being uh, disappointed by the Scottish Parliament is because of its limited financial powers. I mean, look at, look at all these manifestos going on again. More doctors, more nurses, more, where's the money going to come from? Scotland's new democracy isn't in action yet, but already it's added a new word to the political dictionary. Neverendum. A neverendum is an ongoing constitutional crisis that never ends. We've got to make this parliament work. We've got to settle it down. We can't have more years of constitutional wrangling, which we've had in Scotland for 30 years now. It's time to settle down for stability, for prudence, and that's what the Scottish Conservatives will stand for in the Parliament. One of the inevitable consequences of uh, independence for Scotland is independence for the rest of the UK. I mean, I believe in a, an independent England as well. And not only do I believe in it, uh, I think uh, an independent England could have a, a marvellous contribution to, to make to Europe. But I, I think in many ways it would be a, a liberating force. And I don't think Scottish politics in the next 10 years should be how we divorce ourselves from the rest of the United Kingdom, how we dismantle and dismember uh, the, British, uh, the British state, how we cut ourselves off. I, I just don't think that makes sense. And uh, I very much fear that if people were um, uh, to elect a nationalist government, inevitably, inevitably, that would become one of the great uh, dominating issues, pushing everything else to one side. I think if the constitutional question was to continue to dominate the parliament, we would miss an opportunity. You know, if you plant a tree, you want to allow it a time to put down roots and to flourish. You don't want to start digging it up at the first opportunity to see whether it is putting down roots. The roots of a Scottish Parliament, growing in the soil of a strong UK, or branching off as a completely new and independent state. It's a conflict that will not be lost or won on Scotland's election day. When the Holyrood Parliament opens for business in July, so will a new front in the battle for Britain. The UK state will never be the same again because all these changes are taking place at a speed that no one really anticipated. So it's quite a complicated picture. Um, it's a picture that's going to change very rapidly. None of us know exactly where it's all going to end up, but it's sure going to be exciting.